Hello friends and welcome to Post Mormon Parenting. We are doing part two of my mini series, How to Raise Ethical Children in Non-Religious and Religious Settings. In this episode, I wanna go over a little bit of the timeline of children developing a moral code and what some of those morals are that we're talking about. So starting age zero, infants obviously have no concept of what behavior is acceptable and unacceptable. All they know is what they need. Toward the end of their first year, that's when they start getting this vague idea of what behavior is acceptable and unacceptable. They start imitating other people and they start learning how to communicate their own preferences. And then around ages one to three, while they're toddlers, they still don't really get right or wrong. They start to show some signs of feeling guilt or shame if they've done something that they know has broken the rules. They start to get a sense of there are rules and what those rules are and understanding that they are accountable to keeping those rules or at least they start understanding that they'll get punished if they break a rule and they might get rewarded if they do something extra nice or good. This period of time is really when imitation really takes over as they start to imitate their caregivers. When their caregivers are saying things like, we don't take other people's toys because it makes them sad, they start to kind of connect the dots. And then really around age four or five is, for most kids, this cool thing starts happening. There's this term called the theory of mind, and that is the understanding that other people around you have their own beliefs and desires and preferences and wishes and feelings and thoughts and ideas that they have all these things and that you have yours too and they belong to you. And it's with this that they can finally start understanding that their behavior really has an impact on other people. This is the time when they can really start learning empathy. Now, these are not hard and fast times. I think my three and a half year old has definitely shown some moments of really unexpected kindness. When I'm obviously upset about something, whether it's she's at fault or not, she'll come over often and say, oh, mommy, I'm so sorry that made you feel sad. So I wonder if some kids are able to develop that theory of mind maybe at a younger age. But I think we just need to be careful when it comes to trying to make our kids feel guilt or shame over something that they can't possibly truly understand yet. That's pretty much all the information I've been able to gather as far as children's moral development in a timeline. Let's talk now about what are some of those values that we want to teach our kids. What is our ethical code? The Institute for Global Ethics did extensive research across societies around the globe, finding what values were most prized among those societies. And they distilled the most common values into a short list. And they include honesty, respect, responsibility, fairness, and compassion. Another great list of ethics is compiled by the Ethical Society of St. Louis, and these are their core values. Each person is important and unique. I can learn from everyone. I am part of this earth. I am a member of the world community. I am free to question. I am free to choose what I believe. I accept responsibility for my choices and actions. Now I know for me, the question of discipline comes up because when I first had kids, when they were little, little, I was really into like rewards and punishments. And I know that that speaks to them as young kids, but as they grow, I want my discipline method to grow with them. So I really appreciate that. In the book, they talk about the five E's of humanist discipline. Example, you want to model the behavior that you want to encourage. Be an example to them of the kinds of values that you want them to learn. The next E, number two, is explanation. We're going to explain why we do the things that we do. The third E is encouragement. Sometimes encouragement gets mixed up with praise. Praise is more, I like what you're doing. That's meeting my expectations. Praise can sometimes be a little bit more about the parent and what the parent likes than about the kids. Encouragement, on the other hand, is more, you can do this. You've got this. I know you can. I'm right here to help you with whatever you want. And it's more about helping them reach their goals and doing what it is that they want to do. So encouragement really puts the focus back on the kid. My six-year-old loves, loves drawing. And it's so easy to say, wow, I love it. That's so pretty. 
But instead of that kind of praise, I found for her and for me, it's more helpful to offer her encouragement and saying, wow, I can really see you put a lot of work into that. You added all these different colors. That makes it very, very colorful. You did this new, I noticed. I noticed you've never drawn a bird before. This is really amazing. You tried something new. Offering encouragement also really helps with a growth mindset. Number four is empathy. When my kid yells at me, you're the meanest mom in the whole world. I can't believe you're making me clean the toilets. This is awful. I just want to play my game. Instead of coming to a war of words with him and being like, what do you mean I'm the worst in the world? If you only knew how terrible other parents are, you know, that's not really what it's about. It's more about what he's feeling right now. And I can show him that I see that and that I recognize that. I can say, I know it's a terrible chore. It's stinky. It's not fun. I know you'd rather be playing video games. I can go into my explanation, you know, we're all in a team here. We all work together to keep our house a nice, comfortable place to be. And it's your turn to do this. So I'm sorry, I know this is terrible, but it's gotta be done. Instead of bickering with him and having that just escalate. And if you're a parent, you know exactly what I mean. You know how that can escalate. We've all been there, we've all done that. The last E, number five, is engagement. Really treat your kids as if they are part of the team. Help them be involved in the decision making from what are we going to eat this week, what's gonna be on our menu, and maybe where we're gonna go this weekend, and who's gonna do which chore. They can be in on it. They get to have a, a say, and that helps them feel like, yeah, you really are part of, of this greater whole and we, we appreciate you, we appreciate your thoughts and ideas and uh, you get to help us make decisions for the family. I really wanna wrap up this episode by reading a portion from the book. It's about a page long, it's called Sidewalk Morality. He says, one day in June, I watched from our front porch as my five-year-old daughter Delaney received a moral lesson on a subject that has fascinated philosophers for centuries, ant squishing. Her brother Connor, 11 years old, and pro-life in the deeply literal sense, found Lainey busily stomping her way into ant mythology on the front sidewalk. Lainey, he screamed, stop it. What for, she asked without pausing. There are lots of others. He spluttered a little bit. Then a classic grin spread across his face. He raised his foot and aimed the soul at her. Well, there are lots of other little girls too. She screamed and ran. The ants huzzahed. My boy had applied a great critical thinking technique by using the faulty logic of his opponent to generate a ridiculous counterexample. I wondered from the sidelines if it would stick. A few days later, as I loaded the last of the boxes for our move, I got my answer. Lainey walked with her head hung low, doing the aimless foot scraping walk of the bored child in midsummer, then announced her intention to go squish some ants. Hmm, I said. She stopped walking. What? Well, I don't know. Does that seem like a good thing to do or no? She shrugged. Tell you what, I said. You think about it for a minute and let me know what you decide. Okay. She took a little walk around the yard and thought. I knew that Delaney knew the answer. Everyone knows the answer. Like most basic moral questions, knowing what's right is not the hard part when your foot is raised above the skittering dots on the sidewalk. The challenge is to do what we already know is right. And the best foundation for that right action is the ability to say why something is right. Not knowing right from wrong is so rare that it is a complete felony defense. You are rightly considered barking mad if you fail to recognize the distinction. And it's so thunderously rare that the defense rarely succeeds. So why do we continue to pretend that our children's moral development is best served by merely dictating lists of rules? Instead of listing thou shalt nots, we ought to encourage our kids to discover and articulate what they already know is right, then ask them why it's right. This, not the passive intake of rules, leads to the development of moral judgment, something that will allow them to think and act morally when we aren't in the room with them. Delaney came back after two minutes. I'm not going to squish ants anymore, she said. Oh, why did you decide that? Because they should get to have a life too, she said, like me. That old reciprocity principle, you can't beat it. This is the end of part two of our mini series, Raising Ethical Children with or Without Religion. If you enjoyed this, please give me a thumbs up, 
subscribe if you haven't already, and leave your thoughts in the comments below. Join us next time for part three, the final in our series, about some of my personal experiences. Thank you so much for watching. Take care.